I think we could start a new trend because actually I have to say that aside from the movies that we've been seeing at the theaters this year, which are absolutely transcendent completely, um, generally uh, our collection, our hard drive collection is like about a million times better than the average run-of-the-day movies yeah. that come out. And um, most of them don't even come close in terms of the mind training value. So you've got like the classics we call them, that uh, like each time you wash them, it just washes your mind. You know, it's like, like uh, primo stuff. And then actually it's kind of like a habit, like oh, let's go see a new movie, or I haven't seen that one yet. I, mean, I have to say literally that with a lot of the movies in the Movie Watcher's Guide uh, and a lot of other movies, I've probably watched some of them probably 10, 20 times, maybe more, maybe some of them 25 times. And I have to tell you the value is enormous. This idea of I've seen that movie before, it doesn't apply metaphysically. Um, it would be like going into a meditation saying, oh, I've done this before, um, I don't really need to meditate again, I've already done that. Go shopping or do something, other activity, like it's an activity. Movie watching with the spirit, when you really give it over to the spirit, is not really an activity. It's actually, it's like a rinsing of your mind. And more than that, it's like a reminder of these very deep principles that are acted out. And, you know, back in the day, 2,000 years ago, Jesus did most of his teachings in public with parables. Because the mind, you might say, wasn't even nearly ready to, to comprehend or to even be touched by the depth of what he was actually speaking about. So he would frequently preface his parables with, for those that have the ears to hear, let them hear. He had to say that really over and over and over because he was speaking of a wisdom and depth, depth that was covered over by so many layers of, uh, of darkness that even though they were gems, people would just have to kind of take in whatever they were ready to take in. And you know, and that's why you, you can read the parables over and over. You can even the prodigal son parable, which is one of the favorite ones that he taught over and over with. You know, to really gain the full meaning of that, that, that really is what A Course in Miracles is talking about. Thinking you've thrown away your inheritance of the Kingdom of Heaven and, and you've lost your way completely and you're completely lost and you have such unworthiness that you don't have, you don't feel the worthiness to even go back, to go back home. And so, you know, you, you finally, in, in the parable, you know, he's feeding the pigs and thinking, you know, even my father's servants you know, have enough to eat. I, I guess he finally compares himself to his father's servants thinking that maybe I can go back and at least have food because he's very hungry, he's starving. And that starts the journey back after it gets so extreme. And that parable was taught over and over and over as a teaching parable. But I'd say these movies, this, what you'll see today is a classic and um, I know some summertime movie theater, theaters, I know in Salt Lake City there's a Century 16 and they, they actually show some of the classics as the world would judge classics, like Dirty Dancing is, was just showing there, um, Patrick Swayze, and bringing back the classics, that's probably back from the 80s or something. Um, I had the time of my life, you know? mm -hmm. it's a great soundtrack and it's a, yeah, it's a great story. And, and yet, the movies we call our classics, they, they're classics because they have such deep metaphysical value that I'd say every time you watch one of them, if you watch it with openness and receptivity, you can see new things that you've never seen before. So it doesn't really apply that you've seen the movie before because you, you have a deeper readiness every time you watch it and then you can actually, you know, really see so to speak, you can get into deeper meanings with the ultimate, which is accepting the atonement. You know, it, it's each time you watch a movie, if you have a willingness, you can be taken deep down toward the atonement, toward the correction in your own mind. And really, that's the only point of anything. There's really no other point to anything on Earth. Earth doesn't have a point. Living your time doesn't really have a point. But the point would be to accept the atonement. And then, if you see the value in these, then 
then you could, you know, you could set up a, like almost like regular classic movies for regular rinsings of your mind. I have to say, most people who are into spirituality, they they put more time into bathing and cleaning their teeth than they do into rinsing their mind um, on a regular basis, and it's available. Uh, you know, so you could do it. So there's nothing holding you back from such rinsing. So this movie is just a classic, and it's funny because it's, it's the way it works. I was just a few days ago. They had all these. Had this thing on Yahoo about where are these stars now that were big in the the 80s, and one of them was. Bridget Fonda. I was like, oh yeah, because frequently these stars get used uh, in uh, some really classic movies. Little Buddha, if some of you haven't seen it, Bridget Fonda plays the, the mother in Little Buddha. And in this, 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 that one and this one are probably two of her all-time classic metaphysical movies. To, to be a classic metaphysical movie doesn't necessarily mean it's going to do well at the box office or that it'll be acclaimed in the world. In fact, probably Tom Hanks' top movie of all time, metaphysically, he says was the worst movie that he ever made. So <laughs> it's this, there's a depth beyond the common everyday perceptions. Joe versus the Volcano, we just had a a powerful mini movie that was made, and that was Tom Hanks. He's come right out in public and said that's the worst movie. He could, can't even believe that he would make such a movie. But you know, if you look at it, you know Steven Spielberg, uh, Kathleen Kennedy, two, two of the biggest names of movies and producers are there, and Meg Ryan playing all these characters. You know, and then he was probably just saying it was, in his eyes, probably like a dorky movie. But the profundity. <laughs> is there. It wasn't really. And that's what, you know, Kevin Costner said about uh, Field of Dreams. They all, all the actors at the time, you know, thought, okay, we'll take a chance. It was like a risk to do a movie like that. They were prepared for bomb, dead, and it just became what the world would say, a classic. It just had its 25th anniversary. But that's why I remind everybody that I've said it for years and I actually saw it in the course about a week ago, that the world is backwards and upside down. I always just said it so often that I thought, that I thought, oh, it's <laughs> Jesus. <laughs> we think alike, you know. <laughs> Ooh, okay, backwards and upside down. What would you do if you found yourself in a strange land, kind of like Alice in Wonderland, you know, where there's all the proportions are distorted and there's this mad hatter, you know, Lewis Carroll's Alice in Wonderland is a great, you know, falling down the rabbit hole. Even the, the quantum physicists use the, the rabbit hole metaphor from Alice in Wonderland, but it's everything's out of proportion and, and it, Jesus says it's all backwards and upside down. So what's so great about this movie? What makes it a classic? Well, it's based on a, what the world called true story. So it's one of these things like just recently in the springtime we had Heaven is for Real. That was based on actual events of a minister and his little boy out in the Midwest, I think Nebraska, and his congregation, and his little boy who, who didn't die, but so he, you can't say he had a, a, a near-death experience, he was, on, he was on the operating table, but he had all these encounters with Jesus and angels and, you know, amazing things, and then the presence to just speak it. Um, that's what's so great about Heaven is for Real. If you haven't seen it, it's, it's amazing. It's been an amazing string of movies this year, both metaphysical and God's Not Dead, Heaven is for Real. It's just starting to flood in. I actually have to say, there's we've had a major string of classics going all the way back to the end of last year, which is about time. It's just like boom, home run after home run. Like you go sometimes X Men. You you wait, they're coming up at our movie. Uh, retreat that we're having in, in September, beginning of September, but sometimes we would wait for like, seems like months or years for the big home run. Mm -hmm. Oh, it's good, it's a double, it's a triple, but then, boom, oh, gotta go see it. You know, it's like one after the next, after the next. It's like Babe Ruth and Hank Aaron taking batting practice, <laughs> boom, boom, boom. They're just home run after home run. Metaphysically speaking, this is like a reflection of our mind. 
because it's no, there aren't really movie makers and producers, directors, actors, actresses. It's just our mind is like ready. And, you know, we got taste there in 1998, 99, right at the end of the millennium with Truman Show and, you know, Matrix and 13th Floor, amazing metaphysical movies kind of heralding. They were like, they were like heralding the coming of, of a new era. This is the dawning of the age of Aquarius, age of Aquarius, Aquarius. Movie-wise speaking, you're in it. You harmony and understanding. You know, this is this is what Marilyn McCoo and Billy Davis Jr. were forecasting back, you know, in the 70s, the late 60s and the 70s. This is it. You're you're in the dawning of the age of Aquarius and. So these movies are coming out pretty regularly, but, but then we have our whole collection of classics which taken by themselves, you know, you know, you could easily, those are 52 weeks in a year, it's like the course is 365 days, you could come up with a 52 yeah. week mind wash um, that would absolutely blow your mind away because the classics have that much power. You know, it's the, the, a lot of the movies that come out, you know, they're just, you know, they're just not worth seeing, actually. They're not, they're not, they're not worthy of your time. Your time can be spent so much constructively in extending the message. And, and these parables, now that you kind of have the gateway into the inroads of it, I know that's one of Nikita's favorite ways of teaching is with the movies. It's like you've got the best tools best tools you could ever imagine, and, and it's so easy to teach with the movies, because people think of them as movies. They're like, oh, and then if I come closer, <laughs> like uh, Rafiki, you know, the monkey, you know, and, and Lion King, come closer, look again. Oh, I've seen that movie. Yeah. Mm. Look again. You really haven't, and I'm sure like, this is going to be a gem for Nikita because it's, it's one of the all-time greats, but, but for some of you who have seen it can happen to you, you know, you, it just, you feel the heart swirling, your heart bursting with joy, because it contrasts the thinking of the world with the thinking of the spirit. And movies, some movies can do that so well. Field of Dreams, if you build it, he will come. It was all about guidance. And yet it wasn't talked about as guidance, it was talked about this whispering voice, which made it much more acceptable publicly. Mm -hmm. If there was anything religious or anything had connotations of, you know, spirit or whatever, you know, it took you in so gently that you just were like with it every frame, every step of the way. And even people who have a huge resistance to spirituality or Christianity or religion would not be offended with that movie. They would be like, oh, gosh, that was a good movie. They walk out of the theater, wow, that was great. It, it has to come in a way that they can receive it. And that's why people get turned off at church. They just have so many connotations in their mind. They don't see church, like we talked about, Nikita and I, as a state of mind. They see it as a theology. And there's a lot of the theology that they, they think is hypocritical, they wouldn't touch it with a 10-foot pole, they'll never go back there again, they have no interest in ever stepping foot in a church again. You know, church attendance for, for decades has been on a huge decline, because people can think of, they think there's so many other things that are much more interesting <laughs> and much more exciting than going to church. That's how I thought of it when I was a boy. I would do anything I could to avoid, I'd go sit in there and I'd sit, they'd sit me down in the wood hardwood pew and I'd be looking out the window and trying to think. But the, if I'd have known that there was this kind of church, <laughs> I'd have been the first one. I'd been in the front row. In the soft seat. In the soft seat, right, ready to go. And asking questions of the minister. But what, what did that mean? What did that mean? I just excited curiosity, you know, because that would have, this would have been the greatest church there is. And now that we've discovered it, why not use it. You know, it's great we have a church service here, but it's like, it's, why not 52 weeks a year, you know, you could, you know, it, that's partly why I think during the consolidation there was this talk of buying a movie theater. You know, it kind of sprang up in the kitchen and 
Yeah, I mean, I was starting to get links sent to me of movie theaters. It was like they were serious about, you know, yeah, I mean, we, really, that's our next day. We could trade in a monastery, we could, you know, it's just like that. Because it was part of this outreach, like, I want, to, I want everyone in the universe to feel the same feelings I'm feeling. I want everyone to have the same access to this joy. I want to give it away. It's this, this feeling is not a place. It's not a place. You know, like Jesus says, the holiest spot on earth is where an ancient hatred has become a present love. Mm -hmm. that, that's what lights it up, is that feeling in your heart. And just that's the feeling with the movies, you can, you can give it away. So, as a setup now, now I'll get to the setup. <laughs> that was a preamble. It wasn't a setup. So, we have Bridget Fonda playing a waitress in New York City. We have Isaac Hayes, the great Isaac Hayes, you know him from music. Um, he's kind of like your, your angelic, like your homeless angelic figure that's in it. Um, you have Nicolas Cage. Bridget Fonda, and now Nicolas Cage, he's been in a lot of our uh, metaphysical movies. A lot of our classics are Nicolas, Cla Nicolas Cage classics. Uh, he's a cop, and he's a cop in New York City. He's got a, a wonderful partner, and his partner is always kind of like smiling and, at him and just shaking his head, because Nicolas Cage plays a cop who wants to do the right thing. He wants to be kind to people, he wants to be friendly to people, he wants to be honest, he wants to be respectful. He's not the kind of cop, bad cop, like in the Lego movie is going around <laughs> trying to, like Liam Nielsen, the voice of the, put the screws on everybody, you know, and really. So he's, he's, he wants to be the good cop. And he's got his things going on, but he's generally, it's based on a true story, so to speak, where he's generally, he's, He's married, he goes out to do his job, but he, he loves his job. He loves to go out in the streets and be helpful. And, um, and he's married to a woman who, <laughs> who is like greedy, uh, self-centered, egotistical in almost all kinds of ways. And it's just a very interesting pairing of uh, vibrationally they couldn't be farther apart. You know, she's married to him, and and he and yet again, when you're in this state of mind like he's in, he demonstrates mm -hmm. he wants to be friendly to all of New York City, and he's very patient and extremely kind with his wife, mm -hmm. as you would expect. You know, it doesn't matter the way people seem to be in the world; it's the how you perceive them is based on where your heart is. So he's he's extremely loving and kind with his wife, and. He is going to go into this like little cafe diner place um, and um, order some food with his partner, and then um, be called away like cops are often called away even after they order something. And he's going to have to leave very quickly. And he's discovering he doesn't have his wallet. And but he even in the midst of being called out, you know, he's just so present that. You know, he, he's just got maybe his coffee, that's all he's got, but he's so present that he realizes, he, and everything slows down for him because he's really connecting with the waitress and he, mm -hmm. he doesn't have his wallet and he, it's like, and he, he can't give her a tip. So that's what starts to set up this real life story of, of, of him basically giving her the option, I think maybe of coming back the next day and doubling the tip or something like that, or half of uh, all he's got on him is a lottery ticket, or half, half of the lottery ticket, or something like that, I think. And then she goes, she's got, and she's got her glasses always sliding down. He's like wanting to help her fix her glasses so that they don't always slide down. He's very kind, and he's present, and he's, he's very loving. But she goes, oh, yeah, she's kind of sarcastic. Oh, I think I'll take half of the winnings of the lottery ticket. So anyway, he, he makes a promise. And that's another good thing about this movie, it's like, you know, we talk a lot about integrity, and really, truly, if you go deep enough, integrity is of the mind. That's why you need all these forgiveness opportunities, that's why you need mind training movies and having your mind constantly rinsed, because the only way you'll ever experience integrity is in the mind. You'll never, 
behavior doesn't exist apart from the mind. Everything is mental. So you can't really have, it be, have an integrous personality, even though that's just a, that's a good symbol. You could say he's, he definitely has that. But we're talking about such a deep calling of integrity in the mind, where everything you think and say and do and feel and believe and perceive, everything, like the levels of mind, are in total alignment. So you're totally aligned with God, aligned with Spirit. That's what we're going for, that's what the atonement is. But these movies, you know, you, your heart starts to be warmed up, you feel a swirl of joy when you even see a character who's trying to do the right thing, who's trying to, who, who says a promise is a promise. That's what his wife can't understand when, when you know, the lottery ticket comes in. She cannot believe that he would actually keep his word. And that's common in the world, you know, people, that's why we have movies like Liar Liar, another <laughs> classic movie, where basically Jim Carrey, you know, plays a character where he basically lies all day. It's just, he lies to his secretary, he lies to his boss, he lies to his child, his son. He just lies and lies and lies and everything. And that makes it a good contrast movie, you know, when he cannot tell a lie. And he is the funniest man on earth <laughs> trying to play a guy that, that cannot lie. Because he, it's almost like it goes against his nature. It's just absolutely hilarious. But in this movie, you know, she's going to be like, how could she cannot actually believe? She plays a great, extreme character. Whether you got this guy that's got a really big heart, he's patient, he's kind, he's always trying to do the right thing, and then his wife <laughs> is putting him to the test. She's like giving him, <laughs> testing that, poking, poking. He can sometimes be so peaceful and relaxed that she, it just drives her crazy. <laughs> she just, because he's too peaceful, you know. It, it, it sounds funny to have too peaceful of a husband, but for her, she wants, she's got ambitions. She wants to make something of herself. She wants him, she can't believe that he doesn't have a better job. You know, for him, he loves his job, and for her, it's despicable. She, he could do so much better, so much better for them as a couple, and he's got this job where he's out trying to be loving and kind to everybody. So, the other thing I like about this movie is, that's the thing about some of these rare true stories, is all the media gets involved. And whenever you have the media involved, all it does is it magnifies everything. You know, it, it was like that scene from back a while where it was that, that O.J. Simpson Chase, where he's in this white SUV, and I mean, the whole nation, nobody can, let the babies cry, let the, <laughs> let, let the whole world fall apart. Everybody's got to be glued to the TV to watch the police chasing a white SUV in L.A. What's the, you know, no, nothing was such a big news. And then when they caught him, and then everybody is guilty, he's guilty, oh, everybody had to have an opinion, and then when they ran the trial, it went off, it's all. That's the beginning of reality TV. That was the beginning of what we call today, Kim Cardizan and all these reality TV shows. That was it right there. Cameras everywhere following a white SUV. Well, that's what I like about this movie. This movie's got such a great teaching, but it would be like following Jesus around with the media today. Media coverage on miracles, media coverage on, on how people, everything is magnified, how people handle it. Because you have an extreme case where the waitress and the cop, you know, of the lottery thing start to fall in love, and the wife, and then the media, and everything gets ultimately magnified in the media, which, which simply drives home the lessons even more. You know, people say, that was, that was a bloody mess, the crucifixion, and all the point of the crucifixion was it was an extreme teaching example in absolute defenselessness, in absolute innocence. And any of you who have seen any of the Jesus movies, including Son of God, the recent one, you see that, that presence contrasted with the world, the seeming viciousness of the world. It's so cool when that Loving kindness and that presence comes together with the, the extreme viciousness of the world. And it gets, that's what I like about this, it gets vicious. 
when the media gets involved, everything gets blown up and gets magnified. And that's another thing that makes this movie a classic, is because if it was just a simple story told, um, it would be very, very, very impactful. But the idea that it got magnified in the media just made it all the better. Because, you know, you have two thought systems and they don't really have a meeting point. And the more magnified things get, the more you can go, I see it. I see it. And then you can start to apply it to your own life. Because it's so, the lesson is so magnified. It starts to make you think in your own life, wow. You can think back to different scenarios that you seem to be involved with and different altercations you've had with people around, it could be around legal things or arguments or fights or divorces or all the different things that people seem to argue about. And then you can see this is like, wow, this is really for my mind to get clear about what it's always been about. Like it's always been about the same thing. You know, this, this healing, finding that kindness, finding that love within yourself. So, so I think we'll have a great discussion afterwards because it's, yeah, every time you wash it, it's a, it's a rinse, the a total rinse of the mind. And, um, yeah, in New York City, you know, New York City's had some pretty uh, extreme things that have been, has been part of its context, its history. Of course, 9-11 is probably most famous for the towers coming down. But the, even after that, there were all these stories around the firemen around the police officers, around the ones that were there, trying to do the right thing, just trying to be truly helpful in, in major extreme cases, you know. I, I've even, I watched a documentary of a, that was basically following a, a police officer on that day when it happened, and the cameras were rolling, they were filming a documentary mm -hmm. on 9-11, they were following this cop around who was, I think, trying to help people and do, you know, on the streets, and then you could hear these, these low-flying planes, and he's like going, well, something's weird, that, that was a low plane, and then, and then it hits the towers, and you've got the whole thing recorded as it's happening, um, doing a documentary on this police officer. Eventually, he's drawn over to, to the towers, and you can hear these so these thuds in the background, it's literally people jumping out of the towers and it's filming, they're on, ground, on the ground in Ground Zero and you can hear these, these, you can hear the bodies as people are leaping to try to leap out of the towers because the towers are on fire and exploding and everything and, and, um, and then it actually it comes in with the, police, with the fire department and you go up into one of the towers, you're in one of the towers, as the other tower collapses, you're in, in filming inside. It's like when they showed this thing on national television, people were like, yeah, get it off of there, you can't. People's emotions were like, so brought up, because it was literally, you know, it'd be like, well, they having the, the camera, like, following this, hop around, and then the police officers are going right into the buildings, and, and the, the panic and everything's going on, and then, and then there's this dust flying everywhere, you know, at some point. The tower, the, the other tower has collapsed, and it's this, like, foggy dust that just completely fills the tower that the documentary is being filmed in. If you get a chance, that would be a good mind watch for all this. We probably can find it, <laughs> put it on the screen. It's a really good mind watch movie, because <laughs> it's like, you're right there, you know. Yeah. You, it's not, like, reenacted, you know. It's, it's like really right there. So with this one, this is again based on the true story so you can kind of get the feel for how it starts to play out and how the media grabs a hold of it and how, um, how you have to be willing, you can, if you're following the characters, to just at every point pause and let go. Just keep an eye on your emotions if you start to be drawn in. You start rooting for any characters if you find yourself drawn in to take a side, if you find yourself um, judging the media or judging anything that's getting magnified and blown up, just remember it's all for accepting the atonement in your mind. It's all for healed perception. It has nothing to do with a movie or a story. 
That's what's so good about it. Okay.